listening to I Am Refocused Radio with your host, Shamaya Reed. This show is designed to inspire you to live your purpose and regain your focus. And now, here's your host, Shamaya Reed. Hey, welcome to I Am Refocused Radio. We are here once again today. We have another show lineup for y'all. We have our special guest, Dick Lybrow. And man, he has an amazing book into thrillers and if you're into humor this is a book you want to get it is Kane you can get it on Amazon is available right there Kane a humorous supernatural thriller and you can go to his website is dickwhitebrow.com again on Amazon just search Kane a humorous supernatural thriller and you can get it right then and there so first and foremost Dick thank you for uh, being available to talk to us today on the show how you doing man Good, brother. Um, of course, Shemaya, always available for you. Uh, and I'm coming to you from the future because I'm here in Auckland, New Zealand, where it is it is your tomorrow. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> so I bet here in this part of the world, we are sworn to secrecy, though. I can't tell you what's going to happen. Um, but I will say things are going to be fine. Things are absolutely fine. I mean, you made me laugh in the first minute of the show. So this book is <laughs> definitely going to have some comedy in it. So I appreciate that, man. When it comes to making people laugh, you obviously do that very well. And when it comes to writing books, at what point did you like say, you know what? I want to make sure my books have humor in it. You know, it's a sort of thing, at least with me, because when I was growing up, um, I was born in Canada, moved to the United States when I was nine to Jersey. And so, <laughs> uh, so a chubby little Canadian redhead boy with a Canadian accent in Jersey, you got to learn how to have a sense of humor or it's not going to go well for you. And so, so I learned at a real young age to have a bit of a sense of humor about stuff. And it's sort of been ingrained into who I am. And so I did that through stand up comedy. I did that through, uh, doing years of rock radio. And so even when, even if I were to try and write something that was straight, like a straight up thriller, I would fail because there'd be moments where I would go, oh, this guy should say this, this, this woman should say this, or this moment should happen because I really love humor. I love the voodoo of humor because it's so amorphous. And, and once you kind of get it inside you, you want to share it with other people as much as you can. Um, you got to, you know, you got to know your audience a little bit because some stuff is going to gonna fly with some people. It's not going to fly with other people. But once you kind of get a bit of a feel for that, and it's people pleasing, to be honest. I mean, you want to make other people laugh. Um, as a kid, when I was nine, if I'm honest, it was a control thing. Because when you get somebody else, because I was a target. You know, uh, I, admittedly, uh, I, I put myself in that position in a new school uh, coming in there. And so humor was a way, finding a way to be funny was a power shift. If I've got you laughing, you you don't have power over me anymore. Do you know what I mean? And so, so a, as a kid, it was a defense mechanism to learn how to do a bit of a power shift. I didn't know at the time. I just knew that people didn't steal my lunch anymore. <laughs> That's good. And then as I got older, it became something that this is a bit of voodoo. And luckily, I got a bit of that inside me, and I like to share it. Man, that's good. I mean, th there you go. I mean, I wish I had this growing up. I probably you know, got bullied so much. But <laughs> when it comes to uh, the book series that you're doing, Kane, let's talk yeah. about this character. And is this character funny? Is it serious? Tell us a little you know, bit about it. Yeah, so that's the fun part of this, because there's, a, there's so many different types of comedy. Uh, when I was growing up, I was listening to, you know, I, I liked, you know, rock radio and I liked heavy metal and all that, but it was almost embarrassing because, you know, when I was growing up, we used to listen to cassette tapes. And so I would have cassette tapes. And so my buddies would go, what are you listening to? It's like, nothing. What do you got? And it's no, no, what do you got? And I had Eddie Murphy, <laughs> Steve Martin, Bill Cosby, George Carlin. Like, what is that? Who are these guys? I would be listening to comedy. It was something I really enjoyed. And so that's some storytelling comedy. And, you know, another sort of style of comedy is the farcical kind of comedy. And I've written those before. What Where Kane is funny, he is what you would say unintentionally funny or or specifically the things he says are funny, but he doesn't think so because what he is, and I'll give you a, a very short, I guess, description of Kane. He was a wolf up in Canada. And then this infected man bites him the next day. 
he's human. Cain becomes human. And then over the next year, he's raised by this, this French Canadian couple uh, and he learns the ways of people. And so the book is about how he's joined by this character named Imelda and she's you know, a part-time criminal, uh, but she drives him around because he's trying to find out who this person who bit him was, this super soldier he finds out later, find out who this person is so he can reverse it because he wants to become a wolf again. He misses, the, he misses the days when he could run free and naked through the woods. I mean, he, he could still run free and naked through the woods as, as a human, but he'd get incarcerated and probably some unfortunate frostbite. But so the fun and the humor from Cain then is him observing humans seen through an animal's eyes. And the fun of that about the things that we take for granted every day, he sees them and sees how ludicrous or silly they are and where he doesn't feel necessarily that this is a funny moment, people reading it go like, oh, yeah, that's exactly right. We are, as humans, we are ludicrous. And it, and it becomes funny that way, if that makes sense. Yeah, it totally makes sense. I mean, when it comes to the book, too, there's a group called The Organization. And they yeah. want an expensive secret in the man's blood. Tell us what all that is about. Yeah, so the idea is that the thing that turned a cane into a human, um, the organization has been working on, basically has been working on this serum to make, as I said a moment ago, super soldiers, right? Um, and so they've, they've spent billions of dollars in creating this. And then one of the best, you could call prodigies of their experiment, um, this guy named Cal Davis, he ends up escaping, but he's gone nuts. He's gone, he's gone crazy. And he has a bit of a bloodthirst. And so that's why he attacks the wolf in the woods. Well, once he attacks the wolf in the woods, that is basically a virus that is carrying some of these changes in physiology. And once, once he's bitten Cain, those changes change Cain into a human. And, and so it's, as I can best describe it, it's kind of a, kind of a reverse werewolf story. And I'll be honest with you, Shemaya, I, I, I don't read monster books, so I don't even describe it as a monster book. The only monster book I've ever read is uh, Frankenstein by Mary Shelley when I was younger. So it's not a monster book in that sense. I just, I find it fun to turn things around. So, th so I call him the wolf wear because he's a reverse werewolf. He's, he, he's a wolf that has become human. But when the moon comes out and we're talking about humor a bit, so when the moon comes out, he does turn into this massive werewolf type creature when the full moon's out, right? But the humor side of me said, well, why, why do I have to wait 28 days? <laughs> I'm impatient until the full moon comes out in my story to make him this big snarling beast. And so, so part of my brain was, why not? It's still moonlight. Why not a half moon? Why not a quarter moon? Why not a sliver of a moon? Why not those things? And so I started to think, well, maybe he'd become a lesser kind of werewolf. And a lesser wolf, of course, is a dog. And so he actually, when, when, when the moon is not full and he steps into the moonlight, if it's like a half moon, quarter moon, if it's a sliver of a moon, he actually becomes a little lap dog. If it's a half moon, he becomes a pug. And everyone seems to love the pug. If it's a three quarter moon, he becomes a Rottweiler. So the larger the moon phase, the bigger he becomes. And then that also becomes funny because now he's experiencing life through the eyes of a dog. And so that was part, you know, part of that was about not one and a half to wait 28 days until I get to have some fun and transform him into something. And the other part is realizing that there, there's humor there. Realizing that having him turn into a dog is so ludicrous from what's already a ludicrous premise, that just gives me an opportunity where there might be funny. When I used to do stand-up comedy years ago, it was a little bit like that in a way, right? You, you would do a bit or you would set up a bit and you would go, I know there's something funny in this space here with this observation or this scenario. And you get up on stage and then you wait for people's reaction to it. You wait for somebody you know, to laugh or nod or whatever. And then you kind of pick out the bits and pieces that work. And a little bit like life, you find the stuff that works and get rid of the rest. That's something I learned in my radio days as well. You keep the stuff that works. And so what I did was I would just make those better. I'd take those moments that were getting laughs or getting nods from the crowd and I would bring those up bigger and bigger. 
when I was doing a stand-up bit. So it's a little bit, a little bit like that. And now I've sort of honed that skill myself. When I'm writing with Kane, is I find I found I, I knew that there was something humorous. There was something funny in this idea that yes, he turns into this werewolf type creature. But there's humor in this idea that he turns into these various dogs. And so I was able to be able to craft those and make those scenes out, and especially because we have his partner, Imelda, that part-time criminal I mentioned. Uh, she's there almost reluctantly. She's just there because she gets paid by him to drive him around. And increasingly, she ends up becoming a bigger, bigger part of the story. And especially when he's a smaller dog, he can't do too much. So she's got to take over. So it's a, it's a fun partnership between them. And that's where some of the greatest comedy comes from. Some of the greatest humor comes from. It's not just doing knock-knock jokes. It's, it's the interaction of people, about the confusion between people or the um, confrontation between two people. Um, that can be where there's a lot of humor. So a good chunk of the humor in this book is between these two characters. Once again, talking to Dick Wybrow and about his book that you can get on Amazon is available right now as part of a series because you have another edition to the series coming out later this month. Give us a little sneak preview of what that next book is going to be in the series. Okay. Do you know what, do you know what I want to give you? Uh, Cause we're talking about refocused to some extent, right? We're talking about ways that maybe um, we can, we can find some purpose uh, in our lives. And so I'll tell you about how book three came about in the most wonderful way. And, and I had to be open to it. And that's something as, you know, I'm in my fifties now, I had to learn how to do that. This idea that you're going to have these um, moments to come to you and you've got to, you've got to be either confident enough or humble enough to go, I need to listen to that. And that's what happened to me. So I was, Every now and then I have the great privilege of speaking to readers around the world and they will send a note to me. Say, hey, listen, uh, our reading group was reading Kane. We'd like to talk with you. And I'm always up for that. And so I was talking to this group from the United Kingdom up in the UK and all morning for me, I've been just starting out book three of the Kane series. And I was sitting there going like, because <laughs> I'm what's called a discovery writer. So I sort of discover the story as I write. I don't plot everything out. I create the characters and they kind of tell me what the story is about. But in this case with book three, I was sort of struggling. I was like, where am I going to go with this? I just, I, I don't know what my next steps are. And so as I'm speaking to this readers group, so I took a break from beating my head against a wall. And I'm speaking to these lovely people in this readers group. This woman from New Brighton, I believe. Um, and the UK says that she, she got a kick out of the book and she got her husband into the book. And she said, I can't wait for, for us to find out more about Kane when he was younger. I was like, younger? And she goes, yeah, yeah. When that year that he spent on the farm with that French Canadian couple, when they sort of helped him learn how to be human, I'm really looking forward to learning more about that. And so I said, well, you're in luck because that's what I'm doing in book three. I'll be doing exactly that. And, and at, cause as she's saying it, this was a desire of hers. Now, many years ago, I might've been like, yeah, yeah, I'll probably get to that. I wouldn't have said that of course, but yeah, I'll probably get to that. But I was open to inspiration. I, I left myself open to inspiration. And the moment she said that my brain went, of course, that's what you do. Of course, that's what part of book three is going to be about how he learned how to be human and all the wonderful things that this 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 French Canadian couple gave to him and and the love that they gave him and how he turned into <laughs> for a wolf a pretty great guy a pretty great man but it was that conversation that I had with her over a Zoom link two different parts two entirely different hemispheres she's fifteen thousand miles away from me. And yet, don't check the math on that. I have no idea. <laughs> I'm not good at math. That's why I write books. I'm terrible at math. <laughs> but, but she was able to connect with me over, over that sort of length, of, uh, that distance. And I contacted her a little bit later on. I said, hey, listen, I thank you very much for helping inspire the book. That was, that was such an amazing thing. And she was tickled about that. And so if I'm ever up in the UK, we're going to hang out and have a chat. And maybe she can tell me what I can do a book for <laughs> well, she can probably be on your marketing team too, because uh, it sounds like she's keeping. Dude, those, it was great. 
you know. It was great. Plot twist, come in, come in. And then that kind of leads me to my next question. You mentioned about you kind of just let things come as yeah. you are reading. I mean, excuse me, as you are writing. Yeah. Do you uh, now keep this as a opportunity in the future with the example of the woman uh, giving you feedback as part of your processing when you write in, you know, a new addition to the series? Yeah, I don't. Um, I've got what are called beta readers. And so mainly these are people that have been with me for some time. I've got about a dozen people or so that read my stuff. Um, but it's not really like, I don't make massive changes off of what they say, but like, for example, one of them just, uh, yesterday said, Oh, listen, you've got Watts instead of volts. So little bits like that, but also if they've got questions that I thought I had answered, like, Oh, that, this, that one thing might that do this instead of this. And I was like, Oh, you know what? I hadn't made that clear. And so that can really help. As I said, I'm always, I'm always open to, to readers, um, interacting with me and, and telling me the stuff that they'd love to see. But for the most part, the book is generated from characters. Um, I got a chance to, I mentioned doing radio. I got a chance to interview the great Tom Petty, um, uh, an old rock musician many years ago. And he was telling me because everybody likes to ask him as any other creator, where do you get your ideas from? And his response was a, was a quirky smile. And he said, well, they just come down as these gifts. He says, I, I don't really seek him out. I open myself up to it and they come down as these gifts. And so when I'm writing, I just let the characters, and I know that sounds a bit flaky, but I let these characters tell me what we're doing. And I've had some amazing moments, uh, personally, as a reader, while writing, seeing things develop that I had never planned on, but I just sort of become a bit of a conduit for these characters. And I'm not saying I hear voices, uh, but I do have these characters in my head to where they become pretty real people. And they start giving me an indication about what happens uh, in the story, um, or even just a slight variation. There was an example in another series I wrote, and I had two characters, and this is going to sound gonzo, but I had two characters that were breaking into this this tech headquarters, and so they're sneaking underneath through these uh, through this tunnel. But the floor, the tunnel is electrified. If they touch the floor, they're going to die, so they can't touch the floor. So they end up both riding Roombas, <laughs> Roombas across the floor, heading down the tunnel. But so as I'm writing this scene, and I was just thinking about, it, I just need to get them inside. It's kind of fun that they're riding along these Roombas and arguing the entire time because they have sort of this love-hate relationship. Suddenly, one character decides that he wants to get inside first. And so I'm writing this and I'm experiencing as I write it that this turns into a race. These guys have people chasing them that, that, that want to kill them. The floor, if they touch it, is electrified and they'll die. But in the middle of all this, that dude wants to be that dude inside. He wants to be first because of course they would, because that's how these two characters are. They're kind of goofy in their own way. And with all this danger around them, he still wants to be first inside. And that came purely, and I mentioned that as a small moment, just giving this idea about how that happens dozens and hundreds of times. Just a small moment to where I decide that they're just going to go inside and the characters go like, no, I'm going in first. And then suddenly I'm writing about this fun moment where they're kind of competing with each other. And since they're uh, Roombas, they're you know vacuum cleaners, right? They're, they're mm -hmm. robot vacuum cleaners. Like, oh boy, he's taking a sock and he's throwing it up forward. So the Roomba scoots up forward to get to grab the sock. And the other guy's grabbing something off his body, chucks it forward. And it was a fun scene. But all of that came from just creating these characters that have a voice in my subconscious and tell me what they want. And I've learned to just listen to that. You can't always listen to it, it's chaos. <laughs> but there are definitely moments where you listen to that and move that forward. And it's been really rewarding for me and apparently it seems to be rewarding for the people that read my books. We're talking to Dick Wybrow and go to his website, dickwybrow.com. I want to visit what you kind of mentioned earlier about the uh, the gifts part. Right. Because I think yeah. that's, that's probably a crucial point in the interview because I think that's true. Uh, yeah. some of the best gifts in life uh, you don't don't always look for. They just kind of come to you. And I like the idea that uh, that's kind of how you explore your writing. You just yeah. let it come to you and then 
huh, okay, let's go in this direction and go in that direction. Because like I told you before we even started the show, how I even got started doing this show. And it's a funny story because some people actually think that I actually plot this all out. <laughs> like I went in stream detail and said, this is my goal and this is, you know, right. what I want to do for my life. And it's like, nah, I feel like God has a funny way to have, you know, kings of comedy in his court because uh, he likes to make people laugh too. Because I feel like he has a sense of humor. And I feel like when life happens, you either happen with it or you just don't live. You know what I'm saying? And not in and a dark I, way, but just in a symbolic way. Like, you just got to keep chugging along. And I, and probably like you, like I, I remember years ago, um, I was in radio. I was in Southern California and we got an offer to go to Boston, which from Southern California, it was still a big market, but Boston was a major market. And so me and my partner at the time, uh, my radio partner, we flew up there. We met with everybody. They loved us. We signed the letter of intent saying, listen, not a contract, but we're, we're going to do this. And that deal fell through. And then suddenly I had already, we had already done our sort of like goodbye week on the radio, but then we didn't have a gig to go to. And I tell you what, I was beside myself. I was like near tears and my body was losing his mind because this was it. That's what we wanted. We wanted Boston. We wanted to be there. This was going to be an amazing opportunity. This, if I just had this, everything would work out. I've worked this out. I've plotted the course and it includes Boston, but it fell through. And it was the greatest thing that could have happened to me. I'm glad that fell through because I saw the person who came in after me and how that person was treated and how things happened. Thank God that wasn't me. Eventually, I ended up getting into Atlanta and I ended up meeting the woman who, who is my wife now. And I got out of radio and moved into television all because I didn't get Boston. I don't know where I would be. And I tell you what, I knew that that was my success. I knew that was my shot to the big time. And I was wrong. I made that plan and I was wrong. So it's tough. And when you have that thing, you want desperately that thing, you know, this, this is going to make it for me. Sometimes, I don't know, you take a look at it, it might be a higher power, the universe, whatever you might want to call it. They got a different plan for you. And they just go like, yeah, that, that's not right for you. <laughs> you ain't going to get that. And in fact, they were glad I didn't get it because of how horrible the person that ended up being in that slot ended up getting treated. And things, <laughs> the choices that I didn't make in that sense worked out much better. I still think you got to strive. I never would have gotten Atlanta without chasing after Boston because I made a lot of noise in the industry after that. Funny noise, but noise otherwise. So that, that part of the process has to happen. You can't just sit back and say, okay, bring it to me, bring the gifts to me. You got to go out and knock trees around till the fruit comes down. And the fruit happened to be Atlanta, an amazing wife, and a career in television that I just wrapped up two weeks ago. So, yeah, no, it's great. Wow, yeah, because uh, when, you, when you say all that, it's like, yeah, boom, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Because I feel like sometimes in life, it's just mile markers. And yeah. it's like certain pivot points that lead you to this, not necessary different route, but just another road and your whole life is a journey but sometimes you are being on detours and <laughs> traffic jams and construction and then all of a sudden the road is smooth <laughs> and then it gets rough again and I just feel like that's the cycles of life like I, I joked with someone uh, about a month ago talking about sports how we all take turns to chair our team because <laughs> it's cycles man like at one point, you had the best talent, and then they get old and retire, and then mm -hmm. you suck again, you know? Like, yeah. that's life. Sometimes it's great, and sometimes uh, the lemons don't get sugar. Right. And, and the, you know, and the guy who's sucking, then he moves on, you know? Yeah. He moves on to something else. I mean, I remember when I was living in Atlanta, John Smoltz was the guy, and then he ended up becoming the relief pitcher, so he's not the guy anymore. But I tell you what, when he came out, Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He only threw nine pitches or so, right? Nine, 12 pitches. But when he came out, 
look out. And then after that, I think you ended up doing something else. So yeah, when, when life starts making some choice for you, as we said a moment ago, you, you got to go out and, and head down the path. You got to be moving forward because when the turnoff comes and you end up taking that, you can't take it without moving forward. So you got to keep moving. You got to keep doing your thing, but also being open and humble enough to realize that sometimes when that turnoff comes, that, that opportunity is there, even though you weren't planning on it, take a detour. See what happens. You never know. You might get an amazing career out of it or meet the woman of your dreams. Yeah. Once again, and talking to Dick Lybrow, go to his website. It's super easy. DickLybrow.com. And we've been talking about his book, Kane. We have uh, addition to additional uh, part of the series coming out later this month. I believe it is yeah, yeah, it's December 26th. Yep. Yeah. And, and then this is cool for people that are audio people, which is everybody listening right now? Yeah. <laughs> the audio, the audio book is coming out on January 16th. And I'd love if you would you pre-order that. And I'm not just saying that, please help the pre-orders, but the two people that are doing this are so brilliant. It is, I've listened to some of this. It's like, cause I created this story in a two car carpeted garage in Auckland, New Zealand at 4 AM riding away. And these two Hollywood actors have brought their talent and passion and love into the story. And it is a blockbuster movie of the mind. It is so good. So if you're an audiobook listener, um, you just take a look at uh, Amazon or Audible. It's right there. Look it up. And trust me, you are going to love it. It is going to be so good. I can't wait. January 16th is when that comes out. Yeah, because uh, just to give a little sneak preview, uh, there is going, there's going to be a plot twist in this one. Uh, apparently, Something puts Kane in danger. And, yes. you know, some things going to happen. So you're going to have to get that uh, pre-order right away when you uh, finish this podcast. As we wrap up real quick, going full circle, you are known for not having, you know, traditional jobs, I would say, right? And it's almost free, right? Because it sounds like you just kind of like trust your gut and just see what else happens and see what else happens. What would you say to those who have issues as far as like trusting their gut, as far as what they could be doing with their life and maybe they're just playing it too safe? I think part of it is, and it sounds like old man talking, but you really do have to find somewhere where you love. And if you love accounting, that's great. Do accounting. But if you don't love accounting, yes, you could go and get into that because that's safe and stable. But like what I do for a living, I've been writing for 30 years. And I've only just in the last five, eight years or so really put some time behind it, but I never stopped. So if you if you really want to see success in something that's sort of outrageous, just keep at it. Just keep at it. And yet you, got, you might have to do other stuff on the side, but keep at it. And when, when it comes to trusting your gut, there's a guy named Malcolm Gladwell who wrote a book called Blink. And basically, in a nutshell, he says, our, we don't trust our instincts anymore. Keeping in mind that these instincts were honed <laughs> over hundreds of thousands of years to keep us alive so the big toothy creatures didn't eat us. <laughs> so if, if your gut is saying something, if your gut is really telling you something, even if everybody else is saying something else, I would say trust your gut because that's hundreds of thousands of years and ancestors back there that worked all that stuff out to where you are right now. Trust your gut and go for it, even if it's scary. In fact, especially if it's scary. Yeah, great words. I mean, sounds like an author to me. So, man, go get the <laughs> book on Amazon and mark your calendar for later this month. Just after Christmas, you can have another gift to give yourself or someone else. You can visit uh, his website, digwybrow.com. Once again, once we're out of time, I want to say thank you to you for spending some time with us, not just talking about your book, but also giving us a little insight on your life. Absolutely. Thanks, Shwai. I really appreciate the time, sir. Mm-hmm.